What do you do when you find a checked bedsheet in the bins at the Goodwill? I've got the sleeve on. Well, if you're anything like me, you live your period movie dreams and you turn yourself into Eleanor Dashwood from the 1995 Sense and Sensibility by hand sewing yourself a gown. Welcome back, I'm Kate and this is my sidekick Julian. On this channel I do a lot of historical sewing, general DIY, and a bit of home renovation. This video is a part of Virtual Jane Con and I want to say a big thank you to all of the wonderful volunteers who have made this happen, especially Bianca Hernandez Knight. May we endeavor to deserve her. <laughs> also check out all of the other wonderful videos. So after applying to be on the Pride and Prejudice dating show, which I was not picked for, I decided to make my life be a sense and sensibility, live in a cottage, wouldn't change a brick of it, even though we have a dark hallway, small pokey stairs, and not a fireplace that smokes, but a fireplace that's full of birds. The dark narrow stairs of pokey hall and a fire that smokes, I suppose. That's comparable, right? His life, in fact, is not a Jane Austen novel, except for all the ways that it is a Jane Austen novel. You know what Eleanor Dashwood has, besides deeply repressed emotion, she has a fabulous wardrobe, including a couple of checked dresses that just... delightful. When I was rummaging through the bins at the Goodwill outlet, I found the perfect bed sheet to make a dress inspired by these checked gowns. So I got the Laughing Moon pattern and decided to dig in. I probably should have checked the reference material because the dress I made is more loosely inspired by the dresses in the movie rather than in an exact copy. So without further ado, let's get into the checked dress inspired by the 1995 Sense and Sensibility written and starred in by the absolutely incomparable, iconic, and frequently drunk at awards show Emma Thompson. May we endeavor to deserve her. Make the laughing moon pattern, they said. It'll be fun, they said. It's only 126 pages, they said. Initially, I bought the Laughing Moon pattern as a PDF because I intended to just project it and trace it out instead of printing it, but then I lost my projector when I moved like 3,000 miles across the country and had to figure out how to do it the old-fashioned way by taping 126 pages together. I very quickly regretted this decision and wish I had just purchased a paper pattern because I am in fact an enormous baby. The process was in no way helped by the fact that I contracted a contagious illness a la Mary Ann. Yes, I got the Rona. <coughs> On the other hand, this was the perfect excuse to lay in bed and hand sew a gown. For weeks. If you too decide to go this route, just make sure you have a lot of tape. I'm not kidding either, I went through at least three rolls of tape, and please also don't do this outside on the grass because that'll just make it all wet and crinkly. It's best done on a flat, even surface. I was then rewarded for my hard work by cutting out the pieces of the pattern, which was infinitely simpler than taping. The pattern pieces necessary for this gown are the sleeve, I chose style A, which I should have cut at three quarter length, the bodice, which comes in three parts, the strap, the front, and the center back. Next are the ties for the back of the dress, which are quite long. For the apron front, I chose the darted option that works with views A and C. Next was the center front skirt panel, which is cut on the fold and which I forgot to tape the very last piece to. Lastly is the enormous back of the skirt, complete with train. In order to be a very good, responsible sewist, I yeeted my mask so that nobody would have to leave the room running and screaming about contagion. Then I ironed my fabric. Pro tip, don't lay dramatically on it in some grass because you will get bug guts on it and they will not come out easily. Then I tetris the pieces together on the fabric, hoping that there would be just enough to have a train, and tried to cut as straight along the checked pattern as possible, but in retrospect it was not quite straight enough. I then convalesced in a countryside sunbeam by sewing together the entire gown by hand, even though I had definitely intended to just use a sewing machine. To figure out how the pattern worked, I started with the bodice lining. I just used running back stitches to keep it all together. 
My spatial reasoning told me the strap in no way fit on the bodice, but you really just sew along the line, and then when you fold it up, the seam allowance will go down correctly, so trust it even if it looks a little wonky. I next jumped directly to sleeves because no thoughts, just vibes. I carefully measured out the seam allowance and then did some more running back stitches. I felt comfortable doing this because I knew I would flat fell the seams down to finish them and thought that would give it a lot of strength. To accomplish said flat felling, I trimmed down one side of the seam allowance leaving the other one long, and then I very carefully folded the long end over the short end and pinned it down flat against the fabric so I could whip stitch it very carefully in place trying to make sure that the stitches did not show on the front of the fabric very much. Then I circled back to sew the fashion fabric of the bodice together so I could attach it to the lining later. Why did I do it in this order? Who knows? But it looks pretty good. I laid the lining on the fashion fabric right sides together and tried to match up all of the sewed and pressed seams. Then I pinned it all in place together so I would be able to stitch around the outside, leaving the arm side unstitched so I could flip it later. This is a more modern or stage method, which is actually listed in the instructions. If you want to be more historically accurate, you could fold in the lining and whip stitch it around the edge. I had to pause my endeavors for a very, very important jewel bean cameo. Because spring in the country had exploded into a riot of beautiful blooms, I took my sewing outside to enjoy it. With the bonus and lining very carefully pinned together, I stitched around the outer edge with a running back stitch. By the way, if there's anyone in Western North Carolina that just wants to create a cottage core contingent that sits around in fields sewing stuff, please let me know because I would be very into that. Julian just joined me, so here's his input. Before you can flip and stitch the lining down to keep it from showing, you have to clip the curves. This will help the round neckline stay flat. I started by trimming down the seam allowance, but got sidetracked. <laughs> so, um, what, what's up the chimney? Birds. Birds? Birds are up the chimney? I know. It's uh, for the video. <laughs> oh! With that concluded, I actually clipped the curves along the neckline. After trimming the seam allowance, this wasn't really necessary, but I figured doing both couldn't hurt. I then flipped the bodice right sides out and pressed it before stitching the lining to the seam allowance, trying not to let any of the stitches go through to the outer fabric. This understitching helps keep the lining from showing when you're wearing the dress. While I'm not sure this is technically correct, my preferred method is to do some very spaced back stitches that happen between the lining and the seam allowance so that not very much of the stitch is showing on the lining part, but it's still pretty sturdy. Next, I did a running back stitch around the edges of the ties, leaving one end open so that I could flip them inside out. I very carefully trimmed down the seam allowance to reduce bulk. Then I used my fancy dancy and relatively inexpensive loop turner to flip this inside out, but you can also use a safety pin, sew on a piece of string, or you know, just somehow finagle it inside out so that you can press it. I'm getting over COVID, hence the mess, but look! Got the sleeve on. It didn't seem like it was fitting for a minute there, but it feels like it's fitting again. Got everything cut out, just need to start sewing the squirt stuff together. The voluminous pleated back panels of the skirt are cut in two pieces and sewn down the center back, and you also have to cut slits in each side so that you have an opening for the apron front. So to finish off the slitted openings, I folded them over twice and then very carefully whipped them down so there would be no raw edges left.
You could also accomplish this doing running back stitches or plain back stitches, but I wanted to try and make them as invisible as possible. Next, I did a running back stitch along the two back panels of the skirt to connect them, trimmed down half of the seam allowance, and did a flat felled seam. And if you think it looks like this step took forever, then you're right, because it did. Then I used the markings on the back skirt pattern piece to meticulously create pleats, which I then completely got rid of and redid freehand so that they'd be more centered in the back because no thoughts, just vibes. Yes, this did take forever. No, I'm not sure that there's an even amount of pleats on each side of the finished gown. Pleats pinned in place, I did a back stitch to make sure that they were all set in place before connecting it to the bodice. And at this point, the weather turned foul, which was definitely foreshadowing. I think it's going to rain. It will not rain. I always say that, and then it always does. Of the enormous mistake that I made with the center front skirt panel. Oh, I fucked up. I forgot to take that onto the front before I cut up the whole skirt, so I'll have to piece it in at the bottom and just hope it works. After piecing in a sizable panel in definitely the most noticeable place in the skirt, I finished off the bodice closure. The lining of the apron front dress is slightly longer than the fashion fabric, creating a panel that you can tie in front. So here, I'm finishing off the edges with a whip stitch, and I also whipped the fashion fabric to the lining on the front after folding it over. At this point, I had miscalculated the release date of this video and thought I had one month less than I did, so I was rushing, and I'm not sure if this is exactly the method you're supposed to use. I would suggest finishing off the edges of the lining piece before doing this because I did have to undo and redo this because it was pulling in the wrong direction. While you can finish these edges with a spaced or running back stitch since they'll be covered, I went for another whip stitch because I just liked how invisible it looked. This time the instructions did not say to whip it real good, but I did anyways. Next it was time for sleeveles, I mean setting the sleeves. To accomplish this I ran two rows of gathering stitches along the top of the sleeve and pulled the strings to gather it down until it fit into the arm's eye. Then I matched the notches on the sleeves before distributing the gathers evenly and pinning them very, very particularly in place. I made sure to leave the lining free so that I could use it to cover the raw edges and finish off the sleeves, which I still have yet to do. Then I backstitched all the way around the arm opening to set the sleeve. And amazingly, I only had to do it once. I then attached the skirt to the bodice while binging a delightful show about gay pirates. Piracy is our Seriously though, watch our flag means death. I attached the skirt to the bodice using back stitches. This is going to take a lot of weight, so I wanted it to be a very strong seam. I finished off the front closures by adding sateen ribbons, which I then had to replace with some cotton string because they were too slippery to tie. Then I used a running back stitch to attach the front skirt to the pleated back skirt for the apron front. I wanted to see what this bad boy would look like on, so I pinned on the apron front and straps to get a better picture of what it might look like finished. It was a little floppy. These shenanigans did inspire me to get back to it, so I headed outside for a little bit of sewing. I was soon joined by the best part of living in the country, the pack of friendly dogs from the neighborhood that will just randomly show up to spread joy. Our BFF, which we nicknamed Brown Dog, on this day brought me some sort of a little baby golden. It was really fun. So cute. Small baby. Tiny baby. This might be the best part of living in a sense and sensibility. Country dog. Spirits refreshed by pairs of paws, I finish the bodice by whipping the lining down to the skirts. This adds a little extra support. 
I also flat filled the skirt seams. Next, I attached the ties to the skirt front. I backstitched about three inches of the tie to the ends of the skirt, and then I folded over the rest of the fabric and whipped it down on the back side so it was invisible. Then I attached the top of the apron front to the skirt using the same method that I did to attach the bodice to the back. Beautifully finished dress. Almost finished. After giving everything a good press and adding a drawstring to the neckline of the apron front, it was time to wear this bad boy for real. And because I was too lazy to add any sort of closure to the top of the apron front, I just pinned it in place, because that's period, right? I added the drawstring after the fact because as the patron of the Itty Bitty Titty Committee, there just wasn't enough to fill out this top, and gathering the neckline made the whole dress look a lot more finished. If there's anything I might go back and change about this dress, it would be making the ties smaller and adding some sort of loops to keep them up above the pleats. It was then time to deeply confuse my lovely rural neighbors by prancing around in my front yard like a ghost. It was at this point that my dew-covered train got wrapped around my shoes and I got very stuck in my dress and nearly fell over. To make up for my wildly historically inaccurate hair, I donned my apron made using Stitch and Addiction's Eleanor apron pattern, which I'll link to above. With the apron on, I added a $2 approximation of a bonnet, which I got at the thrift store. Because historical accuracy is important to me. Just look at those nails. Maybe someday I'll learn how to wear a bonnet. Today was obviously not that day. Then I yeeted the apron, which is also period accurate. Then I strolled through our cottage garden, which is out of focus for aesthetic reasons, not because I couldn't see the tiny screen on the camera. I waved to my confused neighbor in their enormous truck. And then I frolicked in a field because I am the main character of my own weird little period drama. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like it and subscribe. And in the meantime, may we endeavor to deserve her. You can decide whether that means Emma Jane or Bianca, because honestly, how do we deserve any of them? Or, in the meantime, keep making. And if you would like to support the channel or just be the main character in your own period drama, Check out the link below for my coloring book, A Quick Succession of Busy Nothings, which has scenes from all of Jane's novels, including Sense and Sensibility, with original illustrations from H.M. and C.E. Brock, as well as Hugh Thompson, who was an illustrator born in the late 1800s, not to be confused with Hugh Grant, the floppy-haired gentleman from this movie. Make a train, they say. It'll be fun, they say. It won't get six inches deep in mud, they say. This is the wrong movie. Did you see her hem? Six inches deep in mud. Looked positively medieval. Wrong movie. One outing in it and it's already a mess. Oh boy. Good thing I'm doing laundry today.